matchless love and beauty in this world. Nothing in this world would satisfy me. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. presence is the definition of heaven. There is no heaven without your presence. And here we are. Not only in the place, but as the place of your choosing. We're not only in the place, we are ourselves the place of your choosing. Thank you for inhabiting us. We seek the fruits of your habitation. We seek the fruits of your habitation. As we search and behold this perfect word, this complete law, may we come to the liberties of your presence, the joys of inclusion, the glories of admission, the excellency of beauty, the fullness of all that is ours in Christ. We're grateful and we thank you. name of the Lord Jesus we have prayed. Amen. Praise, Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you 
Jehovah. Our guest minister. Welcome, sir. Ah, because I don't know why you were not there all along. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise, Praise God. God. It's great to be back for another episode of Lord Year. It's uh, Tuesday, the 30th of March, 2021. We're excited to be bringing to your homes and for those who are here uh, from our location, the church event studio, we bless God for the grace to, to share ministry and this time with you. And it is my joy, my joy, honestly, to welcome you to another Franchise Tuesday. We began Lord Year two Tuesdays ago, or three Tuesdays ago. We, we, we hold our midweek services twice in a month, the second and the last Tuesday of each month. And we began this, this amazing in-depth Bible study journey called Lord Year. Lord Year is the Greek word for studies. And that's, that's what we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be continuing in our study of the book of Acts. In the first episode, we studied Acts chapter 1, and today we go into continue the journey with Acts chapter 2. Trust me, that chronological study of Scripture is very beneficial to you. Many of you never get the opportunity to really read the full context and backgrounds to a lot of Scriptures and verses of Scripture that you, you quote and you reference. It's important to get the full picture so you can benefit from it and be blessed by it. Praise God. Hallelujah. The things that matter in these times, the things that, you know, can set us apart as the church in the midst of uh, uh, the lot in this world, the things that can stand us out as the pillars and the lights to which men will come, that they may find our God, are contained in the book of Acts. If we may just do uh, a review, by way of review, let's, let's just go over some of the things we learned from Acts chapter 1. Any, any, any uh, thoughts recollection of certain things that stood out that were highlights, high points, uh, noteworthy, notable things we said when we looked at Acts chapter 1 that you might want to recall today. Praise God. It would have been nice to start with Femi to tell us what he heard so he doesn't think that since he's not on set, he's supposed to go and sleep. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Um, so I think I'll just speak on one thing, and that was the most, um, I think that was one part we, dealt, we dwelt so much on, and that's the later verse, um, that should be verse, um, about verse 24, um, mm -hmm. from 22, where they were to select the replacement amongst the apostles for Judas. Mm -hmm. And one thing we learned or we got to understand was that the Holy Spirit let or God let them or walked with them via what they understood at that time. So it, it was clear that at some point in our life, we might do some things and it seems it's permissive, it looks right, it, but it's because we are at a particular stage in our lives. So as we advance in life, or as we advance in our spiritual work, we find out that we advance in the ways we express God. I mean, having to cast lots in our days today, we consider that as um, being um, illegal or irresponsible. Uh, but in their time, that was the way or the best way or the most, um, what's the word now? The most fair, thank you. The fairest way to determine a person. So God worked with them. The Holy Spirit still breathed upon their means to ensure that they, to help them select or elect an apostle who would replace Judas. However, going forward, we found out that that was never mentioned in the scripture. So yeah, that was a very interesting point for me. God works with us based on where we are, but expects that we advance as we go. Beyond where we are. And for the benefit of those who didn't join us for that, what he's re referencing is in Acts chapter 1, and it's the uh, it's the story or the account of uh, the decision of the disciples to replace Judas with a man named Matthias. And two brothers were up for selection to join with the apostles in the communication and propagation of the gospel uh, in all their crusades and their travels and their mission. And they relied on 
uh, the medium of casting lots to determine who would fill that space. Albeit they prayed before they did it, and God honored that prayer, and the man, um, Matthias, came up and became the, the 12th apostle to travel with them in their ranks. However, as he said, we realized that that never happened again. And that teaches us one thing, that the Lord would you know, deal with us at our level, but he expects us to journey beyond that place and grow. Any other highlight that's important? Um, uh, what stood out for me last, last, on last episode was verse 1 and, and 2, where, okay. where um, Luke was writing to Theophilus. Yes. So you made it clear to Luke, us the physician, yeah, writing to, to Theophilus. Theophilus, a public official. He mm-hmm. made it clear to us that if Theophilus had hoarded the scriptures, it wouldn't have spread through to us down to us because Theophilus, um, Luke specifically was addressing Theophilus in these letters, both in his letter, both in the first letter and this one. So by one means or the other, these letters found their way to us. So what this means is that any word we get for a season might be to a person, but the instructions there are laden and can be spread down, passed down from generation to generation, and no word of God or no word inspired by God is a waste. Even more uh, profound is that we, we had learned, or rather we learned, that the labor of Luke, the physician who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts, in detailing so much of the record of all that Jesus said and did, both in the book of Luke and Acts of the Apostles, all just for one man to let you know that no soul in the eyes of the Lord is considered less. That every soul is so valuable that the labor of an entire book of the Bible, in fact, two books of the Bible, were channeled to and then through that man to us today as the church. Imagine that Luke the physician wrote the entire book of Luke and the entire book of Acts just to one man. So the next time you walk into a church of two people, three people, in your house, wherever you are, do not consider that your labor over that your group of one, I mean of two, three, four people is a waste. The entire book of Luke and the book of Acts were written just to one man. And God honors such labor. Jesus said, I will leave the 99 and go find that one sheep that's lost. God honors that labor. Honors it so much that he ensured that that labor of Luke became canonized. It made it to the canon of what we now call the Bible, the bibliography of divine writings. Praise God. So it's very important that you take note of that. Learn a big lesson to make sure that wherever the Lord has placed you, over whomever, whether they be 10, 1, 100, 500. All that Luke had was with the attention of Theophilus. We didn't hear much of Luke's work except in the writings of Paul, who commended him, Luke the physician, as one of his, the members of his company, his mission. But as far as the record of Luke's work goes in Scripture, Luke, by the way, is a Gentile. I mean, was a Gentile. Somebody who was not... Uh, a Jew, and yet the Lord had him, you know, make it to, to the rank of the synoptists, one of those who wrote the four Gospels, and then one of those who wrote, I mean, the man who wrote the book of Acts, the only book in the Bible, by the way, that chronicles all the events of the early church for us to see the patterns and the examples of how to do church even today. So it's amazing that God would allow that a Gentile should do that. It speaks greatly to inclusion, to admission, but more importantly, is don't miss the point. Never ever despise the value, play down the value of every soul. Whether as the soul to play down your own value or as the one who has prefectship or you know, leadership over anybody. Consider that Luke stands for you as an example of how much industry, how much labor, how much work ought to go into the souls of men. Never ever Think that the only time you should put in all that effort is when people are many. And God always honors that. Remember, 
Jesus said, your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. So many things we never get as public acknowledgement is the result of many things we never do in secret as sacrifice. A lot of our, you know, lack of sacrifice in secret is what is responsible. You know, we like to invest money, time. We try to get PR experts to help us blow, make it openly. God admits men to public honor based on secret sacrifices. God admits men to public honor based on secret sacrifices. You can't pay your way out of it. There's no other way around it. You can't pay your way to public honor without secret sacrifices, without secret labors. And look at the life of Luke. Amazing. Two books of the New Testament, of the 27 you know, books of the New Testament, were written to one individual. And today, God honored that labor and made it a part of the scriptural collection canon. Praise God. So, any other thing we want to say before we go to... Okay, Femi, you have something to say. I hope you're in the camera. We can see you. No, you can take my mic. Just come, come, come. Come, come and stand here. Yeah. Okay. Acts 1-7. When, you were, when um, the father said, "It is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in your in his own authority," mm-hmm. and it, it, it really your explanation and the discussion that was centered around it, as regards um, modern day believers, is um, is we're not supposed to judge by how we see it. I'm mean, supposed to just trust him and just walk with him, because like. Pastor always says, what if the time you're supposed to blow is 40, but you want to blow at 20 or 25, then you die at 40. Because in your, according to your own calculations, you're going to die at 70. What if you're supposed to live to 120? Uh, who knows? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really, it really struck a chord in me on that Tuesday, and I was really blessed by it. So, so he's, re- he's referring to Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. The disciples had asked Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And by that question, they were actually asking when Jesus was going to set Israel free from the dominion of the Greeks, the Greco-Romans, who were ruling Israel at the time. They were a colony of the Romans. So as far as they were concerned, Jesus being a king sent from on high, was supposed to also be a political king who should set them free from their colonial masters and their oppressors. And Jesus said, no, that's not why I came. My kingdom is an invisible kingdom. What I've come to give you is power. So don't focus on times or dates. And that's a lesson for you and I, which is what he he just referenced. Human beings like to know when. When. You go on Twitter, you go on Instagram, it's always God when. Somebody buys a car, God when. Everything, God when, God when, God when. It's always God when, God when, God when. But Jesus here tells us it's more important to receive power than to know times and dates. Because when you have power, no weather can stand against you. I was just asking after you. I want, I want them to get a seat so you can join us. No weather. The power of God makes you an all-weather man. Someone says you will bear fruit in your season. In fact, all seasons and all seasons Christian is somebody who is planted. And planting here in the waters speaks of the spirit. So, and that's what Jesus said in verse 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. In other words, by the Spirit, you would be able to fulfill your assignment no matter the environment or the situations around you politically, economically, or otherwise. Christians always want to escape from the situation. Meanwhile, God always wants you to be light in the midst of the darkness. God always wants us to be the standout icons, pictures. God always wants us to be the picture of the possibilities in spite of a negative backdrop. God is always after the Daniel in the lion's den, not the Daniel that 
prays that God should make the king not send him to the lion's den. That's the Christian most of us are. The Christian that prays that God should remove them from the situations where his power shows, but yet prays to see his power. For you to see the power of God, you have to be in the situations where they must show. How do you know God is God over lions? If, so in the same way, Jesus is saying, you will receive power. Focus on the, what you will receive. If you receive the power of the Spirit, it won't matter whether the kingdom is restored to Israel or not. In that same situation, you will thrive. And the assignment you've been given will be fulfilled. And there's nothing better than this contradiction of, of the divine of the Lord. Where God chooses the worst situations to bring forth the best of men. That's just, God enjoys it. When that which people call impossible, when that situation where people say nothing good can come out of, can anything good come out of Galilee, of Nazareth, of Jerusalem, of that place, that's the very place, that manger is the very place, the one who will save the world will be born. This same Nigeria is where the thing you think you have to travel to become, to get, is exactly where. So just like you and I, we always want to know when will this change? When we think, no, they wanted to know when. And Jesus said, what's important is to receive the Spirit. If you receive the Spirit, wherever, whenever, won't matter. All weather, you are fine. Praise God. Hallelujah. Any other thing before we... Go to chapter 2 today. We also discussed uh, briefly on verse 1 uh, about everything Jesus began, began to, to do, do and, and to teach. teach. Yes, very important reminder. Yes. So he said um, that in that order, it's important that before we reach out, we are sure that um, the impact of what we've received has been you know, grounded within us. And before we uh, think about others in reference to scripture, we should always think as a, of ourselves first. Yes. And so we should think of ourselves as, um, yes, as recipients mm -hmm. of everything that God is doing mm -hmm. in, in each season. And also as, a, in, as an extension, teach others. So mm -hmm. in that order, you know, we discuss that. Yeah. God wants us to always only communicate what we have tested what we have tested, what we have proven. So the order is doing before teaching. Jesus began to do and to teach. In every translation, that's what you find. It's important to prove that which you communicate. Don't be eager to speak. Don't be eager to show forth knowledge. And knowledge is not complete, is not proven, is not true, is not tested until you have lived it. It doesn't mean that the Spirit cannot inspire you in a moment of time to say things you haven't experienced. We are by no means saying that. And I, I'm a big believer in the fact that the Holy Ghost can inspire you and teach you things even long before. However, in the normal course and order of the Christian life and the example of Jesus is that we do before we speak. Praise God. We do before we speak. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's move on because of time. Um, Acts chapter 2, it's a long read, it's uh, 47 verses long, but it's powerful. And as uh, the practice will be, because it's an in-depth Bible study, one of the things we will not fail to do is to read the entire chapter. We're not skipping anything. We're not going to belabor each verse and, doing, and do verse by verse. We will get to that point, but for, for the course of uh, the early stages of Lord Year, would read the whole chapter and as many verses as stand out would speak to, to the revelations and the light the Holy Spirit will have us receive. Praise God. Okay, so Kenneth, you have to read for us. You're the one with the radio voice. Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, 
there were devout, devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own language being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are, f- are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Pathians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mes- Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we, we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they are just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even of my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene, by doing wonderful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you know, as you know well. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him in f- from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Even David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad, and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead, or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown the way of life. You've shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence." Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants will sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God will not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we all are witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God had made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. For you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. All who have been called by the Lord our God, 
Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourself, save yourselves from this crooked generation. I like Peter continued preaching for a long, long time. time. <laughs> Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over, all, over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord had added to the fellowship those who were being saved. Good. So, let's go in. Since you read, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on this chapter you just read? Out round of... But let me get contributions from every one of you. Okay, one of the things that actually... Um, you have to speak into the mic. Okay, yeah, sorry. One of the things that actually um, struck me in this chapter is the revelation on knowledge that came upon yeah. Peter. You know, it's really like the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, brought about clarity even to scripture upon which they had been reading, of course, for a very long time. They knew the scriptures. They knew what the prophet said. They knew about, they had heard about the story of David and all of that. But the Spirit of God brought clarity, you know, to this scripture. And I think it's the advantage. And it brings us to a point where we understand where God wants us to be, what God wants us to do in season and in time. And I think that's what happened to Peter. His eyes were open to what God was doing there because of the Spirit that just brought light, you know, to that scripture, you know, uh, about what Prophet Joel had said. So I think that's the part that actually, as I was reading, you know, it caught my attention. I was like, okay, so I think, you know, in speaking and talking about who it referenced, you know, and we saw even while Jesus was alive, some of these, uh, some of his disciples never understood, you know, the things that he was saying. In fact, like Pastor said, in, uh, the pastor has been saying in the past two weeks, speaking on truth, um, he's been saying that the things that Jesus himself wanted to share with them, but at the time they couldn't bear because, you know, I mean, they weren't probably mature enough and they needed, you know, help, which had come now with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then he was able to speak in the light of what God, you know, really, in, you know, intended for those scriptures, which they already knew. It wasn't the, just the um, knowledge of the scriptures, but the light in it, the power in it, which then exposed to them what God will have them do and walk in in that season. Okay, can I ask an, in, an important question? Can the Spirit inspire you on a scripture you haven't read? Can the Spirit inspire you and bring light, revelation, out of a scripture you have never read, you've never seen? So, this is very instructive and is, is in tandem with what I've been teaching in the last two weeks as you referenced. First truth, then on Sunday, the spirit of truth. The fact that the supremacy, the, what's the word now? The authority of scripture must be restored in the church. Where before you speak of the works and the workings and the manifestations of the spirit, we must first begin with scripture because that is where or that is what validates what is the spirit. Otherwise, the spirit becomes so democratized and a free for all where everybody can say and do whatever they like and say it's the Holy Spirit. It's amazing that Peter knew the right scripture that related to what just happened because they had read it. There are too many believers out there who think that there is the word and there's the spirit. No, the spirit is the author of the word and all his acts are in tandem with scripture. So 
one of the challenges we have today is that many situations and risings and movements of the Holy Ghost in seasons, in times, awakenings, revivals come, but you don't find believers who are vast enough in the scripture to explain it. So you lose harvest. What happened here was because Peter was already very well vested and invested in the scriptures. He could articulately explain what was going on. Why? Because his watchers, the watchers and the hearers who came from all the different cities of the day as devout Jews, did not know the Holy Spirit. You have to be able to clearly explain to them what is going on. And he could only because he knew the scriptures. Church, we must go back to reading and knowing the scriptures. The spirit must have something to breathe on. You must have pots for the oil to continue to rise. The oil only stops when your pots stop. Our pots are the scriptures. The oil is the spirit. You must make sure that you have the pots. Praise God. The breath of God's spirit comes on what you know. Take note, it's not just anybody who spoke. It was Peter. They didn't say, Peter, please explain. His authority to speak came from his knowledge of what was going on. The one who speaks is the one who can interpret the season. Very important. I guarantee you that a lot of the things that are happening in Nigeria today, across the world today, there are men who can interpret because they can see the connection between the, the prophecies and the things scripture has said and what is happening. So most times the spirit moves and the church loses a moment of harvest because we can't interpret it. Very important. That's what Isaiah meant when he said, it's a day of blasphemy and abomination. Because the women have come to, the children have come to birth. In other words, nine months is up. It's time for children to be born. But there's no strength in the woman to give birth. Who's the woman? The church. The woman is the figure of the church. You cannot bring forth without knowledge. Without knowledge. The issue is never the spirit. The acts that are going on, the acts of the spirit are all going consistently. Is that many of us are ignoring the scriptures. Well, I think we, it's pretty clear and direct. Reason being, it, it, was, it, it was customary as a Jew to understand or at, to, have, to have a great or working knowledge of the scriptures. So it was customary that every one of them there must have been familiar with that. And the spirit, so in our time, it's not negotiable. I'm just but buttressing what you're saying. It's not negotiable um, that if we have to grow or express our the the grace of God in our lives, we can't do without the scripture. You can't, as a soldier, you can't fulfill the dictate of the of your commander if he hasn't said a word. So if you don't know what he said, if he hasn't said go, you can't act. So no, no matter how much we try to um, downplay the truth is the truth, and that's the fact that even in that time it was customary that you understood, you knew, you everyone knew the scripture by heart. And we see the beautiful thing here that so you even made the, the expression or the, the I, I think that's why we have a double fold problem in our generation because the fact that we don't even know what the scripture says, Jesus said, You err because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Yes. So the fact that we don't even know, most of us don't even know the scripture is already a problem for us. And then when we hear the confirmation or a, an interpretation or an explanation, you know, what's the, what is called prophecy, I mean, in, um, in First Corinthians 12, when we hear the dividing or rightly dividing of the word, we argue because we don't even know what the word says. So we just act by head knowledge. So as a Christian, it's almost a proof or it's almost tan in, um, tangent that your Christianity is invalid if you don't know what the scripture says. Okay, there's something I want us to see just to let you know that um, this is very important because it was the same Peter who, who, who spoke this in his writing in First Peter, I believe it is. Uh, I want us to see that. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. 
You see, I can reference the scriptures because I've read them. <laughs> so I know what to look for. Do you see it? And in a moment of the spirit, exactly what we just read is happening now. Yes. We're reading, we're speaking to something of a light, of a revelation. I know what scripture to go to to explain what is happening here because I've read it. Do you see it? Yeah. Even if you want to Google a scripture, you have to know what it says. <laughs> it says. <laughs> so, this is very important. Now, look at 2 Peter 1.19 and see what it says. Now, for the purpose of this Bible study, we'll use the NIV intentionally because of the simplicity of its language. Uh, I, I didn't want to stop you. I started reading already. That's why I didn't say. But, you know, it's, it's important to do that so that, you know, we can be on the same page and use the same words. It says, we also have the prophetic message. Now, what was Peter, where was Peter quoting from when he said, which prophet was Peter quoting? He was quoting Joel in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32, when he was explaining to the watchers what happened. It says, this is the same Peter. And this is a warning for those of us who like to say Old Testament and New Testament. No, all scripture points to Jesus, unless you don't know how to find Jesus even in the Old Testament. Every believer must know how to trace. The entire Bible is like a puzzle. And what you're supposed to figure out and trace out is Jesus. How does it from Genesis to Revelation build up, you know, gradually to showing Jesus as the end of all this Bible is about? Praise God. So here's Peter saying, we also have the prophetic message. In other words, the words of the prophet as something completely reliable. He didn't say just, he says completely, that means we can rely on their words. Why? And you will do well to pay attention to it. So don't say it's Old Testament. No. Pay attention to why? To confirm the things that have already happened. To show you that the Bible is reliable. Secondly, the things that are yet to come to give you the confidence that just as those happened, they will also happen. You can't say, oh, there's no second coming. If the Bible says it, yes, there is. Because the things it said in the Old Testament have come to pass. So you, you can know that the things it's also saying will yet come to pass. That's why we read the Old Testament. To remind ourselves that the word of God never fails. This is Peter talking to people in the new covenant, the church. And he said, you will do well. Who was he talking to? Christians, current believers, you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. In other words, in these seasons when things are dark, we don't know, we can find light in the prophets. To see explanations of what is going on. They had spoken, if you read the book of Daniel, some of the things happening in the church today, the things yet to come even in the end of times, the, the, the last days. Daniel has spoken about them. Praise God. So they are light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Take note, it rises. The Bible says, the path of the righteous is like a shining light. That what shines brighter and brighter onto the perfect. I taught it in church when I say every season of your life is just stages in the rising of the sun. So you are never down. You are just rising. Praise God. So this is what Peter is saying. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. It's an article of particularization. Hmm? The morning star rises in your hearts. Praise God. So that's a very important observation for all of us to know that the authority of the scriptures are reliable, they are infallible, and they are the means by which the workings of the spirit in our times can be interpreted. And the benefit of it is that a harvest of men come in. The world is always knocking at the gate of the church trying to understand the acts of God in the times, but most times we can't explain it. covid the whole period of the lockdown is a season in God's calendar. And you had several strife of tongues. This person says this, that person says that. Most times we can't clearly articulate it. Some people are right, some people are wrong, some people scratch the surface. We know in part we don't really get it all. But 
it's, this just goes to show you how much more harvest and fruits the church will have. So hence, I want to take a minute and just pray in the spirit about this. This is the reason Jesus says, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Laborers must not be considered in any other light but this light. Peter is the kind of laborer Jesus is talking about. Those who can articulate, understand what God is doing in a season. Those are the laborers that bring in harvest. Laborers who can identify the difference between wheat and tares, though they look alike. Very important. Wheat and tares look alike. They look alike. That's why the master said, leave them until the harvest. Why? The one that is wheat will have fruit. (laughs) So at that point, it will be different. Now, though you are a laborer and you are an expert, you can tell at this point, don't pull them at this point. Because no matter how expertly you are, chances are you might also pull the wheat. For The wheat is so valuable. God would rather there are tears than one wheat is uprooted. God would rather there are tears in his field than to, in the course of trying to pull them, pull out one wheat. So do you see how expanded this one thing we're talking about? See all the areas I've already extended it to and all the things it has touched. I want us to just pray that God will make us and also add to us laborers. That God will give us the ability to be the kind of laborer that Peter is that can bring in the harvest. Right now also in the world today, as COVID ravages the world, as economies are depressed, as people are facing challenges, as Nigeria is facing insecurity everywhere, the, the hand of the Lord, the move of God's spirit is yet taking place. May God make us the kind of laborers who have learned hearts, minds, and tongues to interpret the season so that many may come to the light of Jesus. In Satua, Kaleman de Bruta, in Danamantela, Lord, make us those kinds of laborers. School us in the scriptures. School us by the Holy Ghost. Give us light beyond the text. Yes, Lord, make it known to us. Hallelujah. Breathe upon these words and give us the wisdom, the wisdom as you give your apostles to speak words that bring conversion, that cause men's hearts to, to be pricked, their consciences to be activated and to seek Jesus in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, so let's go on. Uh, any more thoughts? We haven't heard from you. No, there's a, there's a lot. This is a 47 verse chapter. Yes. So we haven't heard from you. You were just making a comment. You haven't told us what stood out for you. Um, By the way, there's something I also must correct. Not everybody in Israel knew the scriptures. No, <laughs> no. I think it was customary. Yes, but no, not the, it's, it wasn't. It was customary for the priests, for those who were given to scripture to know scripture. You, you need to be careful with that because the reality is the average person did not know. Oh, no, they did not know. It wasn't common. It was, it was uh, those who were vast in scriptures, the rabbis, the people who were given to, it was customary for them to be that way. That's why God said, do not let this book of the Lord depart out of your mouth. Who was he speaking to when he said that? You know, most times when we read that scripture, we think he's speaking to everybody. Who was God really speaking to in Joshua, wasn't it? To Joshua. (laughs) To Joshua. It wasn't everybody. I mean, I I, I agree with you. I see the point you're making that it was cultural to value the Torah. Okay, I agree. I I, I see it was not even... Um, Jesus. It was not uh, common. Even in the temple, they had to. Uh, there are times where Jesus stood up in the temple and, and to read it. the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. It was given to him. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I see. Go, go on. So, um, you know, the, the thing is, this is the story of Pentecost, and or the beginning part is the story of Pentecost. Well, the whole chapter. And so, oftentimes, I like to visualize the whole concept yes. of Pentecost. And so, that's the first thing that always strikes me. The, the opening verse says, "When in King James, it will say, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Yes. <laughs> you know, so it's, I love to visualize that whole scenario and how things played out with them. The fact is something preceded, we understand that from chapter one, that something preceded the experience that was seen in this at the beginning of chapter two. And that's the fact that Jesus had also told them, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Uh, with the, until you are endued with power. 
you know, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you can be my disciple. So, um, it was, it had become, it was something that they understood that this is the next way for us to go. And when we check in terms of the um, chronology, um, the, the time between um, the ascension, or because ascension was, okay, there was a feast about that time. So each of these things, we are marked, Jesus, every event of Jesus was marked by a feast. So the, his death was the Passover. You know, so there was, a, there was in the calendar as given to them in Leviticus, there was an expected time from the Feast of Passover before the Feast of Weeks. Um, um, Pentecost we read about is the Feast of Weeks. was called the Feast of Weeks. So why, that's why or the Feast of Harvest. Or the Feast of Harvest. So it, um, when, when, that was why it became necessary to point out the time when this happened. And that's why it's when the day of Pentecost had fully gone. You know, so it was necessary to trace the history, showing that Jesus was even, the whole experience was still a fulfillment of the history of, of scripture, of the Old Testament, if I would put it that way. You know, what God had said from the beginning, you know, had given instruction. So it didn't just happen on just any day. It was an, at an appointed time that that whole experience came about. And if we had, if we really consider what happened after Jesus' death, and prior, uh, according to the um, account of John, we find out that at some point, they, Peter said, I'll go out fishing. Yeah. If, I, if I said this Jesus thing, you know, work again. More just, let's get back to our lives. Let's get back to things as it was. And it was in that, that moment that Jesus also gave, had an experience with them. So when we consider that, that happened, that experience they had after that time, and the fact that there was, when we consider the time frame between the whole experience with Jesus and his resurrection and him telling them to hold on. The, let me see. I think there was, okay, it was in chapter one where we see they all stay, they were all gathered together in the room. The whole concept of the upper room came about. So having to stay that period of time, will I use the, the word that came to my mouth now was a lockdown. So having to stay that period of time locked, okay, Pastor, you said it last week. Being locked in, you know, it required some conviction about Jesus to do that. And for them to stay put till this day, doing the same thing, even when the Spirit had not come, they are praying. So it's, 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 it's tempting to imagine what, how they went about the whole prayer scenario. But the thing was the fact that the experience had become so deep-rooted in their minds that they could not forget it. So um, recently, I would liken it to something. Recently, I, Sunday, Sunday, according to church calendar, was Palm Sunday. So I was studying, I read about the whole story around the Palm Sunday and all. And I was like, who even start? I actually made a post out of it. Who started the trend? Um, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, I was like, I read it in Matthew's account. Like, what happened? How did all of a sudden um, people just started shouting? But Luke gave some background as to what made the people begin to shout. I mean, they should have stoned Jesus in that scene for you're just exalting yourself as a king, riding on a donkey in that way. So it was, it was something that, we, that was supposed to bring about some chaos. But what made the street guys, I love to call them the street guys because there are people who were surrounded Jesus at that point. So what made them to begin to shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of, to make such message which was, would have been considered as blasphemy. It was because of the experience they had had with Jesus. So one thing here, one thing that stands out for me is the, is the fact that our experience with Jesus, what, how we have come to know Jesus, how we have come to know and experience the love of God determines how much we can express it and how much we can stay within his command. I mean, how can someone tell you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments? That means you're not keeping my commandments because I said it. You're keeping my commandments because you love me. And that love can only come about by an experience of what you've had. Now, it, it was the experience they had, the fact that he had the mighty works they had seen and experienced that he did. So there was this conviction, there was this thing about the experience they had with Jesus that made them know that 
okay, he died, he has resurrected. So everything he has said to us up until this time has not failed to come to pass. So if he has said that we should wait, something is about to happen. So I see that that desire to stay put because we have come to that to to glean and have that experience is very critical to help us stay through situations in our lives. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I believe this is what you are speaking to. And I think it's verse 25 or is it verse 35? Verse 25 it must be. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come on it down. That's verse 35. No, I think it's verse 35. I need to find that scripture. So, this, this I believe is what you are saying. I want to find the particular verse. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yes. No, sorry. It's Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, 12. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12. Are we there? Yeah. It says, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through what? And what? What, do, what happens? What did Joel 2, 28 say? Or promise. It promised the Holy Spirit. When Peter was interpreting in Acts chapter 2, what did he say? He said, the promised Holy Spirit. So there's a promise. And the promise is the Spirit. Then Jesus promised them also that the Spirit is coming. I told you on Sunday that what we really lost in the Garden of Eden was the Spirit. And God immediately promised that the time will come went by the same woman through whom, you know, this disobedience rebellion took place, she would bear a son who would come and open the way for the spirit to come again upon all flesh. So, the promise required faith and patience on the part of the apostles. They had to trust that what Jesus said was going to happen, and the consequence of their trusting that what Jesus said was going to happen was that they will have to wait. And this teaches us something very critical because there are many believers also who fall under this error that once God has promised something, we have to do nothing. The sovereignty and power of God guarantees that what he says will come to pass anyway. But there's always a, a thing to do. And that thing to do is the evidence of the fact that you trust. The way we know. What you are doing tells us what you believe. You can't believe for rain and not have an umbrella. Somebody who's expecting rain shouldn't go out without an umbrella. That's the way we know you're expecting it's going to rain. Action tells faith. So they are waiting tells that they believe, is telling of the fact that they believe what Jesus said was going to happen. In fact, it's telling of the fact that prior to the event happening, they were meditating on the scripture Peter quoted. That scripture was their comfort and stay. That long before Jesus appeared, Joel had prom prophesied that this promise was coming. Now that Jesus has told us to wait, we can't miss out on it because if we don't wait and he comes and doesn't find us, it's our loss. So it was personal for them. They really wanted to experience it. They wanted to be the first fruits of the fulfillment of that promise. They wanted to be the first vessels in whom and upon whom the spirit will come so that they will be able to do and be exactly everything Jesus could do and that he was. Very important. So today you and I must understand that the promise of God is without effort, but the fulfillment, the reception of it is earned. 
God's promise is free of charge. The receiving of it is earned. You don't do anything to make God promise you what he promises you, to earn God's promise. But you do something to earn its fulfillment. It's coming to pass requires that you and I must do as he says. Whatsoever he tells you, don't believe it. Do it, is what she said. She didn't say, whatsoever he tells you, believe it. No, whatsoever he tells you, do it. Faith is active. You must do what you are told. You must do as you are told. There's no self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, what you referenced, if you notice, is even backing up what we had said earlier. The scripture in Luke, where Jesus walked in across the synoptic gospels, where he walked into the city as he was passing through Jericho, and the people began to put branches down, their cloaks down. The Bible says, and this happened to fulfill what the prophets had said. So you see why Peter says you should pay greater attention to it. Because it's a light in a dark day. Praise God. So that's, that's, that's very important. Praise God for that. I, I will take two, two, two more quickly and then I will go to what I think is the heart of this, this scripture. You didn't say anything, yes? Praise God. Praise God. Something that um, really struck out for me throughout the old chapter was the boldness at which Peter spoke and yeah and how the same Peter that denied Jesus <laughs> that didn't have the stomach <laughs> to, to 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 say he was once a part of Jesus' ministry Absolutely. now is the one that is just dusting scriptures and just Making references to Just Joel, making references to, <laughs> to David and everything and explaining the confidence <laughs> is, is, is awesome. And how we see the result of that same day of how 3,000 souls won that same day and how it affected the whole of their ministry even throughout the book of Acts. And it just goes to say that ministry without um, dependence on the Spirit of God is vain. If you're going to um, whatever God has called you to, um, if it's like I'm the basest, if it's to be the basest of judge or to be sound engineer or to be um, the technical, whatever whatever capacity God has placed you in and you do not rely on the spirit of God, I was wasting time yes. and it's your loss <laughs> because you will not reap the benefit you're supposed to, it won't work work in the way you're supposed to work, and you're going to suffer unduly. Instead of just relying on the Spirit of God and get the results and get the work done and make Jesus proud, make heaven proud. So it really, it really, it's really amazing to see that without the Spirit of God, even in today's Christianity, without the Spirit of God, you cannot really do anything. Praise God. That's, that's, that's I mean... It doesn't get any clearer than that. It's very critical. I said this on Sunday when we spoke about the spirit of truth, that the church needs to understand that the Holy Spirit is the life of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit is the life of the believer. Paul says, if you do not have the spirit, you do not belong to Christ. As in, that's very categorical. I don't know why people don't see those kinds of scriptures. It's not even negotiable. You can't say, I am orthodox. I am. And by the way, it's important I speak to something that you know you 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 raised in passing, and I should correct this in, impression, because we like these delineations and divisions. Uh, I'm Orthodox, I'm Pentecostal, and the idea of Pentecostal came from this scripture, and I, I need to correct that now. The word Pentecost is not a type. In fact, the word Pentecost is not a New Testament word; it's Old Testament. Pentecost is one of the many feasts of the Old Testament. God just chose that day, the day when in Israel, Pentecost was happening, and which explains why, if you notice, the Bible tells you they were devout Jews. Now take note, there's a difference between Jews and devout Jews. These devout Jews were not Jews natively, no. They were people who believed and practiced Judaism, the practice of the religion of Judaism, which is the Old Testament, but they came from different parts. So because there were Jews who lived in different parts of the world at the time, they had spread. 
proselyting. They had spread the practice, the culture of Jews. And some nations genuinely believed that the God of the Jews is the real God. And they became, you know, worshippers of Yahweh. They worshipped God, truly. So, they came as devout Jews to Jerusalem for the feast. So, God chose that day, knowing they will be there. So it was, it was significant. That date was significant. So that there will be witnesses. There will be no way you can escape it. It will be on record. I appeared to men. Praise God. So that's why he chose that day. Painfully, people have now said we are Pentecostal. You are Old Testament. That's what you are saying. No. We, we are spiritual. We are of the spirit. The spirit came upon the apostles, the disciples, on the day of Pentecost. Doesn't it? The focus is not the Pentecost. I mean, day of Pentecost. The focus is the spirit who came. Yeah. So we're not Pentecostal. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm a spiritual man. I have the spirit of God. I'm a believer in Jesus who has the spirit of God. I have denomination. <laughs> exactly. Unfortunately, we need to have this Pentecostal. No, no, no. Everybody, whether they go to Christian. Catholic, Anglican, uh, franchise, House on the Rock, Redeemed, wherever, as long as they believe in Jesus and have received God's Spirit, are we are believers. There's nothing called Pentecostal. There's nothing called Orthodox. Praise God. That's very important. Take note of that. All right, so wh what was I saying before I, I quickly referenced this? I was speaking about something before I referenced this. I think you commented on what... Um, okay, okay. All right, so let's, let's hear from you, uh, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? After you, after you speak, I will speak. <laughs> um, okay, I will read from when Peter began to speak to them. That's where I'm, that's my focus is. Uh, he, he spoke, verse 14, Peter stood up with 11, raised, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. After the, the aftermath, as Femi said, the aftermath of this address. Sorry, I remember what I was talking about now. I was buttressing Femi's point about the fact that you can't do this without the spirit. spirit. Yes, before we came to. So I, I wanted to go back to that and emphasize that. The focus is the spirit. Not your leaning, not Pentecost, not, it's the spirit. In fact, there's one, there's one funny thing uh, I don't know, years ago. So if you read the book of Acts, in one of Paul's missionary journeys, he found a venue and gathered believers and taught them in the ways of God for a long time. Now that venue was called the School of Tyrannos. Now do you know that people now who have programs called the School of Tyrannos? I'm thinking, how can you have a program? No. The School of Tyrannos was a place. It was a location. Like two years. <laughs> exactly. So, if it's now written in the Bible, you now want to have a school where you teach believers that you call it the school of times. <laughs> it's the same way we call ourselves Pentecostal. It's not. It's, it's the school. <laughs> <laughs> eh? Do you understand? It's the school of, Same thing with Azusa. Yeah. Azusa is a street. Yes. Where a an awakening, a revival took place. Well, I mean, I, we, can, we can understand why they may say that because it's to ref, reference what happened there. So in that sense, it's okay. But let's not mistakenly paint the picture that the word or there's something to the word Azusa that communicates or that tells of God's spirit and revival. No, revival can happen on Afribank Street. We can actually have the revival of... Uh, of Etimian Crescent, where we are. <laughs> so, in fact, by the way, do you know the word Azusa is actually a Japanese word for a particular type of tree? So, if people even knew that, it just sounds spiritual. It's Azusa. Ah, yeah, exactly. So, but, but it's, it's a Japanese word for a tree type, a species of trees, actually. Can you imagine that? Yeah, you see that. That's why you should trust your pastors. <laughs> we study these things and we know. So, but I mean, let's, we're not making a mockery of our brothers and our sisters. Their heart is pure, they mean well, but it's important that we also uh, 
you know, put forward the correct picture. Pentecost was a day God chose because of the significance, because of the people who were going to gather, the fact that God needed the witness, right, of the Spirit to spread across, yes. And he wanted the Jews who were devout, who followed him as Yahweh, to have the benefit of the light of his will in the now. I mean, it would be, it would be, it would be terrible if God would deny people who followed him, who were not originally Jews, but believed in him and saw him as the, the true one true God and not give them the benefit of knowing that Christ has now come. And this is the way by which you reach. I mean, you can come to me and receive eternal life. So God chose the day of Pentecost. Jesus told them to wait and God chose to send the Spirit on that day. So same thing, as I said, School of Tyrannos was a place in the Bible. It's not a thing. But back to what is important. The Spirit. It's the Spirit who powers everything in the New Testament. Without the Spirit, there's no church. There's no Christianity. There is nothing. You can't believe in Jesus and not believe in the Spirit. No, it's not, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> there's nothing like that. Praise God. All right, so go ahead. Okay. Um, as I was saying, speak, sir. Speak, sir. Speak, speak, speak. The, the, Professor. The, <laughs> The, the consequence of Paul's address yes. was the drawing of men yes. to God. Mm. So that was like the first indication that this is what was this, this is what we were promised mm. for the apostles. Mm. But I'm I'm talking based on the other apostles now. Mm -hmm. This was like an eye opener. That, okay, this is exactly what we've been waiting on. That um, because we read last in the last lodge here, Acts chapter one verse four it said, "Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised." Yes, this was Jesus speaking to them. Yes, which you have heard. Me take note of about. who promised it. This yeah. is why you are reading. The take note of who promised it. So that tells you that Jesus was referencing what was said in yes. the Old Testament. The gift my father, not the gift I promised you. The gift my father promised you. That means he was referencing what he had said through Joel. Yes. Yeah, so go ahead. For John baptized water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Mm. So this was a clear indication that even if there was an iota of doubt in their hearts before, this just cemented their confidence that indeed there's something to this. And mm -hmm. to the people now that... I was speaking before on the part of the apostles, but now to the people that um, had received the Spirit, had, had received, accepted the message of, of Peter, accepted mm. Christ. Mm. Now, this was, it was clear, what, because Peter gave them not just one instance or one... Um, um, it went he, back to back. He, he gave to them both Joel and gave them, them hot, David. Hot Psalms. And it yeah. was so clear that no one could even... Um, they just fainted. They died. They, they had no other they just had to if, accept. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. Because There's no argument. Th there, was, there was no other argument. <laughs> so just clear as day that Jesus is the Messiah. True. And so, True. As, and what you said about um, Pentecost, everybody coming from different places, it further portrays that point that God chose a particular, this particular time because it was like a pilgrim's um, visit or something. They were just coming from different places and they were going to go back. And then in going back, they're going to spread the word that uh, this is what we encountered. This is what happened and this is what I now believe. So this goes to still say what Femi was saying. The spirit, when the spirit is in a thing, it's clear as day. It's clear as day that this is the line we should be towing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Let's take, you see, each time I, I come to a point or we, we come to a point where we we hit at something I sense that the Spirit will want us to pray about. I just call our attention to quickly pray. I'll show you a scripture in Second Thessalonians. As, as you were speaking, it came to me, you know, about the impact that one message Peter, you know, delivered, brought about. You use the word clear, clarity. Because many times what we have in our heart and what is in our tongue are different. And Paul says that that's a factor. Paul's example shows us that that can happen only when we pray for our ministers. We always forget to do that. Hear what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. 
Are we there? Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse one. Can we have it on the screen? I want I want the people at home to see. Second Thessalonians chapter three and verse one. I want you to read what he says. One D. What is all? all, all you, you read. Read read for us. Are you, okay. Um, as for other matters, brothers Take and note, sisters. Take note. Yes. As for other matters, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Pray for us. Yes. That the message of the Lord. See the Master's word. Yes. Go on. May spread rapidly. Did you hear that? Mm-hmm. And be honored. Yes. Just as it was with you. Do you see that? In other words, just the way you received it. Mm-hmm. We always think that the word doesn't need to be prayed for. That if the man of God is so powerful and just shares and it's just brilliant, people will just listen. No, 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 no. No. The word needs prayer. The word needs prayer. I explained at the workers' meeting on Sunday that there's generation before you see light in your house. It goes through three processes, generation, transmission, and then distribution. At the point where you press your switch and you see the light, that's all you know. But power is generated first. It's an ethereal, non-existent, intangible reality. But its force can be captured into turbines through you know, all kinds of uh, hydro systems that can then be channeled and is measurable yeah. in kilowatts and, and all megawatts at the level of the stations and all that. So that's prayer. At the time I'm speaking, it's the switch. It's just light. You need to generate it there. So when we, boom, then there's revelation. All you see and get excited about is revelation, which is why I wonder at the generation that says, you just need to read the Bible and just find, no, no, no. What, reading the Bible and what brings revelation is the generation. You generate it in prayer. So by the time you open the Bible and read it, the light just shows up. Otherwise, it's an academic exercise. You'll be correct, but you're not right. You know, there are two different things. You can be correct and you're not right. Yeah, because it's not appropriate. It's not rightly applied. It doesn't have any impact. And this is equally important because sometimes you can... The same Peter, Paul, spoke in some places and people didn't listen to them. Doesn't mean they didn't have the spirit. So that you can rest knowing that it's not every time people will listen to you or not listen to you that determines whether or not what you said was right. (laughs) It's, this is very important. Take note of this. So you must pray for your pastors. Sometimes it is your prayerlessness that impacts the heart and the tongues of your leaders. And they will start talking nonsense. Your soul depends on it. Pray for us. It said, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as was you. Now this is about the spread. Then there's another one I want you to see. I, there are two. I, I checked. I, I searched for two. That's sec- that was Second Thessalonians, the one. The same Thessalonians, Paul said it again in First Thessalonians 5.25. Hear what he said. He says, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Do you see that? What did he say? Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. I want us to just pray for one minute. Zuka in the battle, Yadema. God grant your ministers. Those who declare your word. Me, everyone in this church, churches of our friends, our brothers, the body of Christ in Nigeria, across the world. Tongues that are learned. Cleansed by coals from the fire of your presence. Help us to be in the fray, in the place where the power generated by the Spirit, the prayer of our people, Land or ikatona mandesi and our prayers. Lante madada. Lord, may dovetail cascade down into truth, clarity that is so pungent that nobody can argue, nobody can gainsay or contest the things that we say. But their hearts are undone, their will undone, and they bow and receive Christ. And receive your will. Receive instruction. That we may reap the fruit of obedience to your word. We may subject everything that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. And arrest them. Our own obedience having been made complete. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you Father.
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So, I'm going to wrap up quickly. Two things I want to call our attention to that I think are, you know, the heart of this scripture. The first one is in verse 1. Never forget, the first verse of every scripture is pivotal to the entire chapter. The words may be simple. In fact, it may be one sentence, one phrase. The first verse of every scripture is pivotal to understand the scripture. Take note. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. See, all. Now go to verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They, take notice, they, not he, not she, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated. So the thread of all, they, all, verse 1, all, right? They, in verse 2, 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each, not a few, each of them. Then verse 4 again, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You see, there is no separation or distinction in the matters of the Spirit. God wants every believer to be full of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the exclusive preserve of gifts to the body. It's not a thing for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Without him, there's no Christianity. You are not a, forget about it. You are not a Christian. Don't say, I've said, no, no, no. Without the Holy Spirit, you are not a believer. Don't even talk about it. Because he's the machinery, the power, the means, the fulcrum, the engine that makes it possible for you to live the Christian life and to be a believer. The things of the Spirit are foolishness to the human senses and the flesh. It's completely stupid, to say the least. The only way is by the residency of the Spirit. The residency of the Spirit is for every believer. All 120 of them, only 12 apostles, yet all were filled. Not, not one missed it. The Bible tells us that the Spirit came in images, figures of cloven tongues of fire, and rested on each one. Look at it. Look at verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, separated. So it came like a pack. The way you have takeaway packs, put in sacks, and then they now started separating and giving to each person. The fire came in, in a pack of tongues and separated. Knew how many they were. Came in that number and went on each one. So that they are watchers. Guess why? Take note. One of the things that amazed those who were watching them and heard them speak in their own language was the fact that there was not one person who was moping. It wouldn't have had the same effect if it was a few of them who were doing it. And this says something very significant to us as believers. A church of powerful pastors who can pray, who know the scriptures, powerful leaders. It's not the picture of the church God wants. From the beginning of of the book of Acts, we see clearly that God wants his entire church to be powerful. To be full of the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit. To be influenced by the Spirit. And God wants each tongue to speak. We, you come here, we gather, we teach you, we equip you. Not for you to go home and be dumb. No. They're speaking all to continue. It all to what? Continue. Each time you come is an immersion in the spirit. Each service, each meeting, that's what it is. Yeah. So that by the time we, there's dispersion, we should create the same ruckus everywhere in different forms and modes. I will explain that very soon. But the spirit is a spirit of all, not some. No, 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 no. No. It's a spirit of and for, in, through all. This idea of they are the leaders. We just come and sit. It's not scripture. 
You ask believers to come and pray. They're telling you, I'm shy. I can't stand in front. That is against the spirit that you receive. The spirit you receive is a speaking spirit. Oh, the way I love to pray, I just love to be silent in the presence of God. Is a lie. This spirit speaks. This spirit, what? Speaks. I told you in prayer, the workers meeting, that Jesus said to us in Matthew, when you pray, say. <laughs> There's no quiet prayer. There's meditation. If you want to meditate, meditate. If you want to sing, sing. But the moment you say you want to pray, there must be speaking. Sorry. There just has to be speaking. Even prayers of thanksgiving recorded in the Psalms, there were words that you can read, that you can say. Praise God. Uh -huh. Before you get to Selah, something was said. <laughs> and it is, it, the reason for Selah is because you heard something. There's no Selah without something to meditate upon. <laughs> So when people say, oh, Selah, be still and know he's God. Take note, be still and know he's God. How do I know he's God? I read something. I heard something. I saw something. That's what I'm meditating on. The Spirit speaks expressly. People, I pray that the church, through its ranks, from leadership, from the pulpit to the pew, will come alive again. And in this mode, be restored to its place and its glory where there's no one in our rank who does not speak. Where there's no one in our rank in whom the spirit is not present and full. Praise God. What gave the apostles the confidence to say to the church in Acts 6 when there was quarreling over issues of distribution of food, the daily distribution of food because they kept all things together, a common purpose. What gave them the confidence to tell the people, choose from among you six, seven men who are full of the Spirit and wisdom? How were they supposed to know who is full of the Spirit? Because they knew that each one of them had the Spirit. Or at least they know who has the Spirit. There are two ways you can look at it. It's either they have the Spirit to be able to discern who has, or at least they know that there are certain things we see to know that this one even the ones amongst them who don't have, we know that, wait, those people that have the spirit, there's a way they talk, there's a way they behave, there are certain qualities and features to their person and personality. Why would they take the risk to give it to the people to choose? Why? They know that at least the worst of them that doesn't have the spirit can identify who has. <laughs> be, and we didn't hear that there was any argument over who they chose. Nobody came and said, no, this one is a lie. No, 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 I don't agree. If this one has the spirit, me, Seth, I have the spirit. <laughs> There's nothing like that. No argument. No quarreling. Very important that we don't raise a church or give the impression that the spirit is for those who stand on the platter to share and to speak. Those who have full-time, you know, Christian ministry. It's not true. Praise God. It's all, they, everybody. Praise God. And then the, what I consider the heart of this scripture is the actual, you know, invasion of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Which I don't want us to miss. And I want you to see something here that is relative to your life today. Because it's important that we, we do some application and not put it in the air. Okay? Now, Hear what the Bible says from verse 5, I believe it is. Let's read from verse 5. It says, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Can you imagine? God made sure, made sure there was no nation that wasn't there. Yeah. Real commonwealth. Every nation under heaven. Every. Don't miss these things. Important details. Verse 6. When they heard this sound... They heard a sound. Oh, Taliando Kosata. They heard a sound. The Bible says a crowd came together in bewilderment. And I was in shock like, eh? What's going on here? That's to tell you that all these devout Jews were not native Jews. They were Jews because of their practice of Judaism. Why? Because after, after the word their bewilderment, hear what the Bible says. It says because each one heard their own language. That means their native language was not, was not uh, Hebrew. Or Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke. Jesus spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. Jesus didn't speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic, Hebrew. Had their own language being spoken 
Take note. Utterly amazed, they asked. Now, their language being spoken is not zebra and they call to shat. That is what we, this, the language of the spirit inspired is a, uni, is, 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 the, is a mysterious language. The Bible says we speak mysteries in Corinthians. It's a mysterious language we speak as we are inspired, moved by the Holy Spirit in prayer who prays for us the will and the heart of God. That's very different from what's going on here because I also need to clear this. There are some people who are compulsive in their understanding and interpretation of the scriptures. And they come and start fighting over the fact that when you claim you are speaking tongues, I don't hear Spanish. I don't hear Igbo. No. There's a difference between praying in the spirit, in other tongues, and the gift of speaking in tongues, which is to convict, convince unbelievers of the authenticity of Christ, of his spirit, and to win people over to Christ. And also to convict people to pass messages across to people is an expression also of prophecy when interpretation comes. So that's different from prayer. Because Paul says we should pray in the spirit, sing in the spirit. Pray in our understanding, sing in our understanding. Do you understand? And then he then says that when you are doing it and there's nobody to interpret, what's the point? In a public gathering, you can do that Privately. So that means Paul is acknowledging that it's possible you can do it and you don't know what you're saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what he's saying. So don't get into all those controversies. Now, we've established that, but that's not where I'm going. My focus is this. They all heard them. All. Take note of the word all again. Right? Because each one heard their language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they ask, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Now take note of all the languages here. Parthians, I mean the, 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 the nations. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, which was a massive, massive nation. Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, Rome, Cretans, Arabs, the Bible says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Right? So, I want us to see something here. What did they hear them saying? You see, you can get caught up in the amazement of the fact that they were speaking in other language and forget what they were doing. The Bible says they heard them doing what? Declaring the wonders of God in their own tongue, the mighty works of God, praising God. That's what they were doing. Let me explain this to you and and relate it to you and I today. God, by his spirit, has given to each one of us the language of men in our different industries and areas of influence. And there is a language you speak, I don't speak. To people who hear you, I speak to people who hear me. And guess what? When you speak, they hear God glorified. And they come. They come to the light of God. There are different languages. And language is not only words, expressions, music, technology, medicine. Because guess what? Nations are not only territories. They are also people types. The original word from which the word nation is gotten is the word ethnos. It means not only geographical entities. It also means people types. Engineers are a type of a nation. Lawyers are a type of nation. They have a certain way they think. There are some languages they use. They use when you say you are educated, they say they are learned. So amongst themselves, I'm a lawyer, so I know, amongst ourselves, there's a way we talk, if you're around us, you won't understand. But when they hear you talk like that, they ask you, are you a lawyer? Because you are speaking their language. There's a language of children. There's a language of doctors. There's a language of women. You say the word empowerment. Yes, they come alive. Yes. Hey, hey, do you understand? <laughs> do you get it? So they, they, there's, there's a language. And guess what? All language do one thing and one thing only glorifies God. 
What does it mean glorifying God? He puts God up yeah. as the one to whom all men should look for all things. Number one. Number two, as the source of all good. He is not the one responsible for your misery. No. He is the good one. Praise God. Hallelujah. They were glorifying God. In other words, setting him above all else. All these people were coming from nations where there was idolatry. Some of them were probably at a point in their journey where they were beginning to wonder, this journey I will come every year. Come to this Jerusalem. Come and make sacrifices. Now that God was being glorified in their language, they were further encouraged to see that Yahweh is the one true God. That's what the nation, the ethnos to which you are sent must always feel each time you speak. When you record that song, what do they hear? When you, when you write that you know, article, what do they hear? It's not just slaying, tensioning people, insulting them online, using vile language, cyberbullying. What do they hear? He choke. What's choking you? Let's say, <laughs> stop restricting airflow. Let's have the one that gives people breath, breath and life. <laughs> Praise God. Do you get? So, these are the things that people, there are different tongues out there. There are tongues that glorify God. And that's the tongue that comes by the Spirit. When you speak both in words and in action, men from everywhere come and they testify. What they were saying is as important as the fact that they were speaking in other languages. It is as important they were speaking in other languages just as much as it was important. I mean, it's as important what they were saying just as it was important that they were speaking in other languages. That's what I'm trying to say. Praise God. Praise Hallelujah. So that's that. Now, take note of what the Bible then tells us in verse 13. Isn't this amazing? It confirms something I said earlier. This will blow your mind. Some, however, because remember, you were saying it was so clear. And I was telling you that you should pray for your leaders because sometimes we can say things so clear and men are just men. Can you imagine this? I want you to read this yourself. Some, however, yes. made fun of them and said, and said they have had too much wine. Can you imagine? So that means that they heard them speaking in their language. Still, they still made fun of them. Does that make sense? How can somebody who is a Jew, a Galilean from Jerusalem, you just heard him speak Arab, you're an Arabian, and you know, it's not as if, no, it's not as if you were told, you know that he doesn't speak Arab, and he's never been there, he's not been trained in that language, yet you still said, you can hear that clearly this is inspired. And yet you still said they have had too much wine. Two, what they were saying was glorifying God. People who have too much wine, they say nonsense. They don't glorify God. Somebody who has really gotten drunk, is it glorifying God they'll be doing? They'll be talking rubbish. Still, you were still saying they have had too much wine. Then take note, this was the, what hour of the day did Peter call it? Yeah? Oh, no. Third hour. Do you know third hour is actually 9 a.m.? Yes, because the, in, it, the, the count of time, the first watch starts from 6 a.m. So, who's drunk at 9 a.m. except an exceptional case? <laughs> an exceptional case. And not just an exceptional case. What are the chances that 120 people will be exceptional cases of drunkards? 120. And they're all gathered. At least of those 120, there should be 10 who are lucid. Who are clear-eyed. All 120. Come on. Ridiculous. But that's what they still said and felt about them. So this, this is to let you know that some will still not believe and we're still not here. And it's okay. It's nothing to... It's not a downer on your grace on what you have received. And it's instead a cause and a call to compassion, to pray that people should not be hard of hearing. Their hearts should not be so hard 
that grace cannot penetrate through. Even with manifest miraculous signs, there are people who still argue. Those who think that, God, we just need more power. We just need more miracles. Once people walk out of the chair, everybody will believe it's a lie. There are still people that say they are drunk. Yeah. <laughs> manifest miracle. Still, people say, it's a lie. They're drunk. Which people? Can, how can that be God? Jesus did mighty miracles. He said, it's a lie. It's from the spirit of the Beelzebub. It's Satan that's working in him. The sons of Belial. There are people whose hearts are hard. There are people who are appointed to perdition. My prayer is that you will not be such. None who is connected or related to us be such. In Satolia Kamande Barosa, you and your household have a covenant. The Lord saves us in our household. In the name of Jesus, a naysaying spirit, knowledge that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. When God is manifestly, evidently at work, people will not argue against it in Jesus' name. Their hearts shall be tender to the gospel. Our generation will not be hard of hearing. Be tender to the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want us to end on this note. Remember that God's spirit is upon you and I. And he energizes us with tongues that glorifies God in the language of men. Very important. He energizes us with tongues that glorifies us in the language of men. And that has many ramifications. Many connotations. In your business, in your office, in, on the street, in your neighborhood, in your estate. When you speak, may this tongue cause men to be bewildered. May they come wondering... You are not a doctor. How did you know that? In other words, the Holy Spirit is bigger than what we use him for. I mean, what we allow him to accomplish in our lives. The Holy Spirit can inspire you beyond your learning. That's what this scripture is teaching. It can inspire you beyond your learning. It can energize you beyond your learning. It can qualify you beyond your learning. He can make it possible for you to manifest and express yourself in a way that those who are experts at certain things will be amazed. You can go to an interview and three years experience, you speak, answer questions and people are wondering, how is the spirit? Is the same spirit. You're using examples, case points, referencing books, notes and people are wondering, how did you know that? Why, why do you know that at this stage? You're just two years in this business. I'm 15 years. I don't even know that. I've not heard about that. And you and I must start to believe God for such movement of the Spirit. That's how we're going to impact our world. That the Holy Ghost will come to the root of your tongue and your voice and sanctify it, energize you. That when you speak, what men hear will be beyond your learning in the name of Jesus what men here will be beyond your pay grade and your qualification in real estate, in sports, in entertainment, in medicine, in education, in politics, in, 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 in healthcare, in, in, in beauty, uh, hospitality, in name it, every profession, in law, in engineering, in construction, everywhere believers are scattered and everywhere nations are gathering around us. May the tongues the tongues of fire, the tongue of the spirit come upon you now and cause you to speak in languages beyond your learning that men may come to the brightness of the shining of Jehovah. May God cause your tongue, your life, the way you do your business, the way you carry on, the way you express yourself to be as a language. May your whole life be as a tongue that glorifies God. May men always hear God glorified when they see you. The way your car is, the way your house is, the way you dress, the way you address people, the way you do your things, your whole conduct. May it be as a tongue that causes men to hear God glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. That's what I believe God for in this season. That the Spirit will arise upon us and make us glorifiers of God by our words and our deeds in Jesus' name. It's been amazing. Another wonderful time. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.